At first, I pushed the lever forward ever so slightly. Time travel in all science fiction. I don't know if it starts with Wells. Utopia. I mean, certainly... There have to have been some sort of conceptual, folkloric, time travel stories, but that's like the first sci-fi Seems to be the general consensus yeah, that, that he it was, starts there. he's the father of it, yeah. And now it's such a trope, and everyone has done it. There is so much time travel, and sometimes, sometimes it bugs me. It has mm-hmm. to be done well, because it yeah. is such an easy out, or I'm stuck for a story idea. Oh, I know, time travel. Time travel! But, <laughs> if you go back to the original... What? Really, H.G. Wells, almost every single piece of science fiction he wrote was not just for the cool ideas. He was sitting there trying to make allegories and morality tales. I mean, the Eloy and the Morlocks. This is a warning of where we're headed. And I do like the classic George Powell's Time Machine. I'm not a fan of the remake. My question is, why can't one change the past? It just seemed like a bad take. Yeah, a misguided reimagining of, of the story. Like they, they give him a different motive for building the time machine. It's because he's trying to go back in time to prevent the death of his fiance. Right. Well, that's so movie making where they're like going, it can't just be intellectual curiosity. It exactly. can't be that. <laughs> It's more personal if it's because of the death of a loved one or something You're like, yeah, but then it becomes stock. And that's the problem. It's actually much more interesting to see one totally driven only by intellectual curiosity. <laughs> now, that's the most important question to which I hope to find an answer. Can man control his destiny? And that is what makes the Powell film and the original novel so gripping to me. And yeah. Rod Taylor, he's so... Oh, I love Rod Taylor. Gentlemen, all I'm asking you to do now is to witness a demonstration of the possibility of movement within the fourth dimension. This is the thing that makes the original movie so wonderful. This is 1960, and they start off the movie in this this heavy intellectual conversation about the fourth dimension. Why is it that we usually ignore the fourth dimension? Because we have no freedom of movement within it. He conveys this sense of euphoric wonder at this thing that he's developed. And in the novel, the same way as in the movie, he brings out a little miniature version of the time machine to right, demonstrate. Yes. So says, yeah. check this out. Beep, puts a lever and it disappears. In the novel, one of his friends argues with him and says, well, if it's traveling to the future, why can't we still see it? it? Clearly, it's traveling through these points in time to get to wherever it's going in the future. And it's like, that's really heavy, heavy discussion. Yeah. Well, if it's occupying the same space, it, well, why can't I feel it? You must remember that the space you're putting your hand through is today's space. You know, and Rod Taylor's character is going, no, time changes space. Don't you understand? <laughs> the same space that's here now should be here in a hundred or even a thousand years. No, now. Philip, time changes space. You know, very passionate discussion. He wants his friends to understand how amazing yeah. this is. And he's heartbroken when he realizes they don't believe him. Even if you had invented a time machine or whatever you call it, what of it? What use would it be to anyone? Who would want to- also, that kind of arrogance I know there might be consequences, but I can't stop myself. I find that to be a relatable emotion. You know, fates be damned. I have to know. Supposing you do go off and get lost in the 50th century or something. How are you going to get back? That's a risk I'm prepared to take. They're such big concepts, and it was well done on Wells's part, and also very well done on Powell's part. How do I feed this to the general masses? It's still worth making something explained and explainable instead of just pretending it's magic. It wasn't a trick. Which movies yeah. could have done? I would tell you how it works, but uh, I don't have time for that. Instead, yeah. they're making the attempt. Like, here is the big concept boiled down. And then you get visuals. And it's still such a great effect of the sped up passage through time. Plus, they keep cutting to his expressions of just going like, I can't believe this. Shit. Yes. Again, Rod Taylor just totally selling it. But you see buildings go up. You see them come down. You mm-hmm. see trees grow from nothing. And it's just great. It's a mm-hmm. perfect way to visualize it. Is it yeah. kind of cartoony to look at now simply because of the time, the technicolor and all that? Yeah. But is it still engaging? Yeah. I love it. What have I done? 
This brings me to uh, Time After Time. Which is such a delightful movie. Malcolm McDowell, David Warner, Mary Steenburgen. You take those three people, put them in any movie, I want to watch it. But is it H.G. Wells chasing Jack the Ripper? That goes right into my vein. Nicholas Meyer, this was the first movie he'd actually directed, but he also wrote it. It's a really interesting way it came about because it was a friend of his who had started writing the novel. He was only like 50 pages into it or something. So here, what do you think? And he's like, this is great. I want to make it a movie. Okay, cool. So they developed it kind of side by side, kind of similar to the way Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke did uh, 2001. It's so funny that that the concept didn't start with Meyer because Meyer is, yeah. he's been a lot of things over his career, but he's one of the original and greatest Sherlockania authors who wrote uh, right. Extended Adventures of Sherlock Holmes as novels. And then a lot of, they got adapted as films because mm-hmm. uh, The 7% Solution, which is Sherlock Holmes with Alan Arkin playing Sigmund Freud. Come on, that's great stuff. He did so many Sherlock Holmes novels, and of course, he's very educated on that time period that he's a natural to have directed this, but it surprised me to find out the idea wasn't his originally. That's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's funny you mentioned Sherlock, too, because they do this little sort of Easter egg mention of when he uses the name Sherlock, they just try to use a different name, not realizing that Sherlock is a household name in yes. 1979. My name is Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, I see. Go on. And then later he's like, shit. Last time you were Sherlock Holmes. Um, <laughs> that was a great moment. Surely there must be a gentleman. Don't be a chauvinist. Well, one of the things I, I noticed, they'd make a big deal about uh, women's liberation and time after time. Women's liberation. <sighs> and right. It's, it's sort of a plot point that Mary Steenburgen's character is pretty aggressive. She asks him out. Right. She chooses the restaurant they go to. If you don't take me into your arms this very minute, I'll scream. She doesn't close her eyes when they're kissing, all these things. And she's yeah. just confident in a way that he's not used to seeing women act that way from his time. You compare that to the original film. And in that movie, we've got Weena, who is like just basically a, a child. Yeah. yeah. I do not understand you. It's also really clever, and Meyer would have known that, H.G. Wells famously was a real progressive thinker Yeah, for his time period, and it wasn't just about sci-fi. He was writing tracks and essays about social science fiction, where, you know, it's like, look, it's equality of the sexes, free love. You've actually built the bloody thing. Well, free love has paid for most of it. The death of monogamy. He was basically very... Like, dude, let's all just do what feels good. Yeah. But I mean, that's kind of what he, he kind of was bucking against the restrictive Victorian era he lived in because Mm -hmm. he saw its faults. Within three generations, the social utopia will have come to pass. There'll be no more war, no crime, no poverty, and no disease either, John. So in a way, he was a science fiction writer past all the aliens and time travel it was about ideas and and society. So yeah. I liked that. And they do address that in time after time. Men will live like brothers and on terms of perfect equality with women as well. Oh, dear. Let's have the past. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Malcolm McDowell, he's such a good actor. He has played all kinds. He's played psychotics and da, da, da. But he comes off very charming and lovable and lost as hg wells in the modern day of 1979 and the fact that he was dating mary steenburgen for a long period at that time Mm -hmm. their chemistry is just spot on and it works as a love story and then you have david warner's jack the ripper and that's all i need are you a typical englishman not really hey neat watch yeah oh he's so great he's so great we don't belong here we violated. We don't belong here. Let me show you something. And I've seen other time travel movies do that, where the villain is usually the one that is not so thrown by like being put in a different world or different time, where yeah, he's like going, like, I "Oh my here, god, yeah. this is great!" I belong here completely and utterly. 
I'm home. It's you who do not belong here. Yeah. He's like, I'm a serial killer in this society, and oh, it's made for me. Look at all and- the prostitutes I can kill. Sorry, sex workers. Sorry, <laughs> sex workers. But yeah, well, one of the things I, I told you about when I first proposed this idea was just how ahead of its time, in a way, Nicholas Meyer's film was that you've, you've got these two sort of, one's a serial killer, but essentially two pop culture icons. No, that's it. Yeah. Kind of ma- mashed together. as so sort of this pop culture mashup in a way. And it reminds me very much of a lot of the kind of crazy ideas that we've had in graphic novels and movies in more yeah. recent decades. But, it, you know, I have no idea if Nicholas Meyer was familiar with his work, but it's very much like Philip Jose Farmer, science fiction, fantasy author. He's kind of the guy that I attribute this whole monster mash idea of fiction because he was one of our greatest fan fiction authors, is what I always say. He did one for Doc Savage, where he finds out that Doc Savage and Tarzan are cousins, and they're related to Fu Manchu and Sherlock Holmes and everybody you could ever imagine, and they called it the Wold Newton Universe. He basically had this whole family tree where every great character you could imagine, not only have they met, but they're probably distant cousins from each other. I love this stuff. It's just like me with my dolls going, (laughs) me with my dolls. That's right. What if Thanos (laughs) met Captain Crunch? Are you kidding? I'm working on it right now. (laughs) And it's going to be awesome. Hey, don't do that. I'm going to do it. Don't do it. I'm going to do it. (laughs) I need to work a little on the dialogue, but I think it's come on. (laughs) (laughs) Don't do it, man. Gonna do it. Put that glove down. Not gonna put the glove down. (laughs) Yeah, it'll it'll get better. It'll get better. Trust me. Oh, and I remember now one of the things I forgot what I was going to say earlier. Oh, good. Both of these movies, (laughs) both of these movies, very artfully skirt around the question of how do the machines actually work. The result is an ever-increasing series of reactions that lifts or literally rotates the machine out of one time sphere into another. They spend a lot of time talking about the concepts behind the science, but they kind of dazzle you with that. Yes. When I speak of time, gentlemen, I'm referring to the fourth dimension. Like Rod Taylor's H.G. Wells never talks about how the machine actually works. Nobody even asks him how it works. Both movies have things you can poke holes in the way it works. Although I will say George Powell's original is much more consistent in the way that it conveys what's happening. There's, there's not a whole lot of holes you can poke in what happens as long as you accept the fact that the machine works as described and, right. and displayed. And <laughs> there's a lot of weird things in Time After Time that I like. I like the fact that when he travels into the future, he winds up wherever the machine is in the future. And that's kind of yeah. interesting, but it does yeah. pose a lot of questions like, well, what if somebody just destroyed the machine? I know. You know? Yeah, I did like that, where it's like he's he's not in England because the machine isn't in England anymore. And in the original movie, you're thinking like, wow, that pretty brass contraption that Rod Taylor's H.G. Wells built. No one thought to move that out of that basement ever. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, the, in that movie, they established that if the machine doesn't land in that time, it's not there. You can't no, yeah. see it. So, yeah. yeah. So they, they avoid that question. They, but, but time after time, very, very confidently strolls into this very shaky ground as far as a, a narrative uh, device having yeah. the machine kind of travel and he's just with that's why they're in san francisco yeah that's why they're in san francisco but also that's why the security guard is like you people again get out of the machine <laughs> you know hey you get away from that exhibit yeah because you realize later he's the second guy that he's caught in the machine you people right almighty so I, I like that and the fact that he's able to it's just it's totally silly the fact that he's able to get a, a spare pair of glasses out of his oh, drawer. Right. His desk. Yes. This is so silly. It is yeah. neat that he's like on, well, sh- that's my desk. And if they, let me see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my really glasses are. are still there a hundred years later, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Eight hour time differences was just because of the time zones. It's very clever. Yes. Little, little touch. Of course. Eight hours difference. But if you, if you think about it too much, it kind of falls apart. As we've already well, discussed. I'm going to say this, and here's a, a very hot take. You think too much about any time travel, anything, and you sit there going, no, no, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. no, no. The other thing was that the MacGuffin, I guess you could call it of the film, is that key, which isn't the key that operates the device. It's the key that prevents it from automatically returning to its origin. Right. I can't have you following me about eternity like the Flying Dutchman. 
Give me the key and we'll be quits. But you don't need the key to operate it. Because he, he goes, just goes down there and steals the machine and travels to 1979 without any key or anything. All I've got to do is to set the date and activate the switches in sequence. And then when H.G. Wells shows up in the exhibit in 1979 and looks at the uh, plaque describing yeah. what it is, it says, like, it's never known to have worked. Like, did you turn it on? Because <laughs> it <laughs> still works. <laughs> so it's, it's, a lot of it doesn't make any sense. Whereas in the time machine, he's got the little knob. It, it doesn't yeah. work without the little knob lever. He takes it off yeah. whenever he leaves the machine. That's like the key. Problem solved. Right there. Then that, that's very clean and neat, you know? And so they, they, yeah, it's a strange idea they went with there with, with a non return. You got to let it go. But they had, I obviously, this they needed has been some bugging reason you why. since 1979. <laughs> you, as a little kid, just sitting there going, like, wait a minute. Hold on. Someday I'll figure this out <laughs> on a podcast. Hello, is this Mr. Meyer? Yeah, my name is Chad Smalley. <laughs> I got big issues with you about the key. Sounds just like me. I, I've been working on that, but <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's a great no. movie from the writing standpoint. What was really smart. I want that key. You could have really made it a chase thriller kind of story with a sci-fi element. But what was so smart was just all the character work. It giving room for having an HG Wells being lost and amazed and actually showing the impact anybody who time travels back or forward that is wonder and it's important that you show that yeah one thing i want to jump back to this euphoric sense of wonder that george powell's film gets to me it's the first film that i've seen that the earliest film i've seen i should say that that evokes that kind of wonder that we later associated with people like Spielberg and Lucas mm. and uh, you know, Zemeckis and Richard Donner, all these people who were really good at using these tropes and, you know, really good performances, really wonderful, uh, fantastical setting. Use the force, Luke. But also with amazing musical scores written, in this case by yeah. Russell Garcia. And that theme, the theme music in this movie. very romantic very sweet yeah and it, but adventurous kind of swelling in yeah. it yeah and he, the way they convey it like it, early in the film after he has his first meeting with his friends he resolves that he's going to use the machine that night he doesn't say it he sits down at his desk and he's furiously scribbling something and the music swells right as he's sitting down at the desk you're like oh he's going he's going you know you just feel this Come on, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to use the machine. I'm sure that influenced people like Spielberg because what he's selling there, what the movie, the director, the score, all of it is selling is this is the step out the door. Yes. This is where it's like, that's it. It may cost me my life, but I have to know what's out there kind of thing. Yeah. I yeah. love that stuff. It goes to like me and you are suckers for a, a heroic narrative and, and we like it for that pure reason not just because badass action will follow it's more about the spirit of like that adventurous thing where even if i'm watching the right stuff it's the same thing i'm like god damn the balls on those astronauts yeah it's like yeah. that's the unknown and they are heroically going forth i think one of the reasons too that meanwhile that i'm a coward complete and total <laughs> coward <laughs> One of the reasons that that Rod Taylor's performance really resonates with me, especially those early scenes where he, any any scene where he's just expressing wonder at what he's created and what he's witnessing, reminds me so much of my own father, who was a scientist, mm. and the way he was almost equally as passionate about what he did, and the way when he would describe his science to you, and he was so good at bringing it down to a, a language level that everybody could understand. He was very good at explaining really complex concepts in a simple way. Did you way. ever witness him? literally have a eureka moment of i'm um, just curious like not where the moment it, like, itself but he did when he when he had the discovery that led to the nobel for just FYI, this may be news to a lot of people watching no if you guys didn't know chad's father the real deal nobel prize winning chemist the closest i got to actually experiencing a eureka moment with him was when he we went to dinner it was a day or two after i think he had 
figured out the structure of Buckminster Fullerene, which is what later won him the Nobel. And it was that eureka moment where he figured out what the structure of this this molecule, this previously completely unknown form of carbon that, that he and his team had discovered. He was the one who figured out what the actual structure. They knew it had 60 carbon atoms. They didn't know what the structure was. He was the one who figured out it was a perfect sphere. You can imagine this excitement that you've discovered a way of putting 60 carbon atoms together that turns out not only to be beautifully symmetric, but it's a soccer ball too. And he was just, just like Rod Taylor in the movie. He was just like, yeah, yeah, this is it. This is the moment that all of us get into oh, science. Dude, for, you know, and he dude. was like a little, he was like a teenager, just, just babbling with excitement. And, and I was totally there with him. So when I see movies like this, where the actors and the directors and the writers know enough to that science is important and wonderful and amazing and it doesn't have to be a time machine but in the course it helps when it right. is a movie right. like this you've got to convey that that sense of wonder and just sheer elation at just approaching the very concept of it movies that feature inspiration and it's the same thing artists writers whatever the thing where it's like oh shit, everything just clicked the wonder of imagination and creativity and that extends to the sciences. I myself don't have a feel for math, chemistry, physics, whatever. I just appreciate it because I know it's the same. I know mm -hmm. those the neurons that yeah. are firing, the synapses, yeah. they're exactly the same. It's hitting yes. you in a pleasure center. And it's like your, your mind literally open to the heavens. And it's mm -hmm. just like, oh, my God. Oh, and my, my father and I had many conversations about that very subject. About Yeah, because you being musician as well as a scientific minded person and him being pure science, but you could meet there because it mm -hmm. is about that, that kind of pure moment. And I love that. I love that. Shit. And yeah. movies that do a story about someone who is brilliant. If you miss out on a moment of inspiration where it's just like, yeah, and then I came up with a thing I called a personal computer. <laughs> If that's how it gets delivered, then you've missed out because you, that exactly. is inspiring to everybody. You can usually tell when someone's genuinely engaged and genuinely tapped in. All day long, will I take my own personal inspiration from watching people just go, and then it occurred to me. And then yeah. it occurred to me is like, those are words like, yeah, tell me what occurred to you. And yeah. that's what led to the creation of this. Um, and I love music documentaries. You see them in there jamming and they're like going, me, that's it. Do that again. Do that yeah. again. Yeah. And then I come in on this and you're like, yeah, it's it. just magic, Chad. It's yeah. magic. You and me creators. We're magicians. Okay. That's right. Ooh. Don't let nobody ever tell you different. Yeah. And as soon as I get my cloak of levitation and the eye of Agamotto, I will be the sorcerer supreme. Oh, I got a question for you, and this is a high concept question. Yes. If you could time travel, where? I would want to go back, prevent John Lennon's death, and then go forward 10 years to see what music he wrote. <laughs> I would do the same thing with Buddy Holly. Yeah, yeah, any of them, yeah. Yeah, you know. because it's just like, dude, you were just getting started, and you were a genius, and it probably would have been awesome, and it would have changed music forever. I would want to do what the time travel does, and just go in millions of years into the future just to see what happens. I yeah. just want to see what happens. As long as I yeah. can safely get back. <laughs> I'm That's down. the thing. 